Uh, thank you, Bernard. And our second speaker is uh, Professor Sterling from the University of Sussex. And uh, he brings a pretty wide-ranging um, scope to this particular debate. His areas of expertise and research are much broader than just food itself, but encompass areas such as, for example, environmental, sustainability, innovation uh, issues. So I'm really looking forward to his presentation. And to one particular aspect in particular, as Bernard outlined earlier, the theory and the legislation is quite linear in relation to risk assessment. But uh, the reality is often far more complex. When EFSA itself was being established, there was a, let's say, one of the more difficult issues uh, in the regulatory process was the actual title of the organization. And at the time, there was quite a body of opinion that it should be called the European Food Authority. However, that was ultimately rejected for the current title, European Food Safety Authority, because regulators wanted to avoid any ambiguity in relation to its role and wanted to confine it strictly to safety. Unfortunately, titles don't necessarily uh, resolve these types of issues. And there is this, let's say, ongoing issue on the extent to which the risk assessment process can and should take into account other factors. And so I'm really looking forward to uh, Professor Sterling's uh, uh, address in this respect, because if you look at his abstract, he raises this particular issue, the polarized debate on science and innovation on the one hand, and democracy and public values on the other. So that will be very interesting, and, and I thank him in advance already for this. He's also going to propose some solutions. As regulators, we hear all the time about the problems, but uh, we don't hear so much about solutions. So I'm hoping I can go back to my colleagues in Brussels with some good, good ideas on how the, the risk management, risk analysis, risk assessment process can find solutions to the, these tensions. So the floor is yours. Well, uh, thank you very much for that kind introduction. So it's got to be interesting, and it's got to have solutions in it. No pressure at all there. <laughs> and uh, also, it's a dangerous invitation when an academic is actually told to address complexity. So thank you. That will uh, pop up at some point in my talk. No, thank you so much for the invitation. It's a great honor to be at such a salubrious event as this, and to be addressing a task which is as daunting and important as that of the European Food Safety Authority. Um, so it's a privilege to be here and to follow Sheila Jasanov. I'm going to pick up many of the themes that Sheila introduced so, so well, and uh, uh, I think it's going to chime quite closely. Well, the title of this conference is about shaping the future of food safety governance. And when one, and, and as, as right from the beginning, uh, Herr Earl, when he introduced the conference, talked about the importance of wider issues. And so I'm going to really focus in on those wider issues at the beginning, the cultural and economic structures and dynamics that actually will play whatever direction it takes, because my title notwithstanding, I'm no more able than anyone else, of course, to actually predict the future, for instance, going from risk regulation to innovation democracy. But what I try to outline in my title are some of the pressures and forces which, like the missing mass, that stabilizes the visible forms of galaxies in the sky will stabilize and, and condition the forms taken by food safety governance in the future. So I'm going to do that first and look at these cultural economic forces, and then I'm going to turn to some of the more specific issues that arise in the challenges of risk assessment and the science of risk assessment itself. So uh, let's move ahead with this. Uh, I'm going to try to do so in an animated way by Referring to the precautionary principle, because no matter what side one is on, and unfortunately in this field, as no one knows better than those at the hard end of food safety controversies, um, these de debates can get very polarized, rarely more so than around the precautionary principle, which is a highly vexed issue on all sides. Coming out of environmentalism and social movements way, way back into the 60s, adopted very early in German environment policy and the tradition indigenous tradition in German policymaking, picked up commendably by the European Union in various forms. And around the world now, it takes many weird and wonderful uh, kinds. But a canonical form of the uh, precautionary principle embodied in European food safety regulation, as in other fields, is the Rio definition, where there are threats of serious or irreversible harm, 
lack of scientific certainty shall not be used as a reason for inaction. And this is worth focusing some attention on because it appears at first sight to be highly ambiguous as a basis for decision making. Um, what is, when is a threat a threat? How serious is serious? What actually does irreversibility mean? What does that, implications does that have for stochastic procedures like a food safety agency is dealing with? What does full scientific certainty actually mean? And do we ever, in fact, have it? Et cetera, et cetera. In the face of these kinds of criticisms, there is a very big literature that asserts that precaution and like-minded principles in food and environmental regulation are somehow non-operational, incapable of meeting the practical, real-world needs of decision-making. And it's interesting here, I'm going to come back to it, that we often hear about the world of decision-making as the real world, as if the real, real world <laughs> wasn't so real as the decision-making world. Now, I'm going to pick up on that tension a few times. But there's a genuine danger that this kind of ambiguity can feed into politically motivated processes of ambiguity, and uh, in, in trade negotiations, this is a particular concern. So what I want to do is just take a quick look, and I think people in the audience here will be more familiar than me with many of these features, about the kinds of anxiety that come out very strongly worded. Ironically, actually, how animated some commentators get within the scientific establishment in, in favor, ostensibly, of scientific, cool, objective rationality. It can get very, very emotive. And we hear that this kind of principle around taking uncertainty seriously stifles discovery, limits innovation, um, kills uh, the green revolution. It's a quest for zero risk. It's irrational. It's a sign of unreason. I'm quoting here some of the principal, uh, I, I mention as I do throughout the talk, some of the names attached to these quotes, some of the principal commentators in these issues across the Atlantic. It's arbitrary, capricious, spreads fear, and breeds chemophobia. It's a battle between science and ideology, says a former president of the Society for Risk Analysis. It's about a kind of religion. It's no basis for policy. It's dangerous. It harms society. And it needs to be countered by a whole host of new principles which contend with it, as, uh, although never embodied in anything like the same legal apparatus. So I mention this just to underscore what I think people already know. And by the way, much of what I will say in this talk, I think are the kinds of things that everybody in this audience knows very well, but actually rather rarely gets discussed front of stage. It's typically the kinds of issues that will get talked about in the bar afterwards, but when we speak about risk assessment, then we present a much more clean uh, picture. But the reason I mention it is because I want, I want to come to muse a bit on why it is that this kind of intensity gets generated around simply trying to draw attention to the difference between risk and uncertainty. Because all the precautionary principle really says is that uncertainty requires deliberation about action. And so that a participatory process, engaging in issues such as the ones that Sheila mentioned around framing and around trust and distribution, can con uh, confer at least as much to the quality and the robustness of knowledge as probabilistic analysis. So what this reminds us, it's simply a guide. It reminds us that science-based methods don't reduce the intractability of the uncertainty. They're not the full answer. It's not throwing the baby out with the bathwater. It just says, don't think everything's been dealt with. It rejects evidence-based policy only in respect of it being complete and a unique and sufficient basis for action. It's necessary, but it's not sufficient. Evidence can speak with more than one voice, as I'll try to show. And it affirms this essential need for deliberation for what Sheila Jasanoff called judgment. Now, the reason this is important is because one of these great forces shaping the dynamics of risk assessment out there in culture more widely is the way we think about technology and science. It's another version of a kind of linear model that was already alluded to. The idea of progress, and there's a rule of thumb among anthropologists, I'm told, which holds that if you want to quickly identify the key fault lines in a culture, the places where there are the greatest political tensions, maybe between classes or genders, go to the origin myth. And in our case, our origin myth is progress which is invoked at the highest levels across otherwise starkly contending geopolitical positions. One cannot impede scientific progress, 
It is an inexorable force unfolding in a particular direction, which is why, for instance, in the European Union at the moment, with so much anxiety over innovation, we hear innovation referred to as if it were just going, it was a single thing. We hear about pro-innovation policies. It's interesting because in no other area of policymaking do you hear people refer to the desirability of being pro-policy. It's a totalitarian language to be pro-policy. The point is, which policy? But in innovation, and in food innovation, this is especially true, somehow that language isn't noticed. It's somehow reasonable to be pro-innovation without attending to the crucial question of the direction. And this is true across a whole variety of different sectors because it's so close to our origin myth. And it comes up in the economics as well, which when one sees economic studies of innovation systems in the food sector as elsewhere, one sees a whole series of technical terms employed to inform policymakers about the nature of the economics of innovation with first movers, early movers, uh, advances, catching up, latecomers, forging ahead, leapfrogging, etc. These metaphors, all of which are very technical understandings in economics, only have meaning in the context of a one-track race. So this underlies the debates about food, as if somehow it's going in a particular direction, and anything that slows it down must be in tension with innovation. And the reason I want to highlight that is because, and I don't want to be too stark about this, but especially given I'm going to point to uncertainty a lot, but this is just plain wrong. Every discipline that's ever looked at innovation, and although they disagree very vigorously about the vocabularies and the details, all agree that innovation is a branching evolutionary process. If, if the process unfolds in one direction, then other directions do not unfold. So in the case of the food sector, for instance, in the kinds of dilemmas faced by EFSA over issues like GM or other applications of advanced biotechnology, we see an array of contending innovation pathways in any given sector. In the case of GM, we see transgenics and, and uh, cisgenics, for instance, rolled together they're both forms of, of, uh, of genetic modification, but with radically different political economies, especially for things like intellectual property. But then beyond that, we see techniques like apomixis, we see synthetic biology, but we also see other innovation strategies, conventional uh, hybridization, marker-assisted breeding, responsible for some of the most prominent responses to drought and, and flood, for instance hardly get a look in, in the debate about how it is only GM that could really realistically have a prospect of feeding the world. And then beyond that, we have participatory breeding, we have ecological farming. All of these are innovation trajectories. And it's in the nature of innovation, just like biological evolution, that movement down one trajectory will in fact foreclose movement down others. Because one thing we know about innovation is that a host of political, institutional, and economic processes close down the choices. They reinforce the trajectories that are being pushed most hard, or that are lucky enough to benefit from an early start, and they narrow it down. I'm just going through a series of these mechanisms now, documented in the philosophy, the history, and the economics of technology. Even the QWERTY keyboard is a canonical example of how no one intended the QWERTY keyboard to lock in. It did so more than 100 years ago. No one was backing it, but we are finding it very difficult to get out of it, despite the fact it's responsible for some clearly suboptimal patterns of health and safety in the workplace. This is an example of how powerful these forces of lock-in are. These are what drive the directions taken by innovation. So what's interesting about this is we don't really speak about it in a risk debate. It's as if risk is just for or against the particular incumbent technology, which happens to be privileged because it is perhaps, for instance, technology intensive, it advances particular commodity, in commodity interests, it has high processing value added, it re allows firms to realize uh, value in intellectual property or their control of a supply chain. None of these things are bad things. They're just how the real, real world works, which reinforce particular trajectories and leave others, like Cinderella, less prominent. And the effect of this is to systematically suppress kinds of innovations in the food sector as elsewhere, governance of the supply side rather than just the demand side, advertising controls, cultural responses, grassroots innovation, open source innovation, public health measures, often, not always, often find themselves in positions without the same kind of backing, and so much more difficult for themselves to become established. This doesn't mean they're automatically better, it just means that there exist very powerful feedback processes 
which act against them. And any reasonable process of governance of food or food safety would take these into account because food safety regulation doesn't mean not doing some particular thing that everyone's shouting about, like GM. It means steering innovation, possibly in other directions. So framing is crucial in ways we've heard, the way these debates are framed, because it orients our attention. And like the proverbial metaphor uh, in several European languages for somebody who has only a hammer, every problem is a nail. Likewise, we have risk assessment, and the only tool in town, the predicament suffered by bodies such as EFSA and other regulatory bodies and everyone associated with them on all sides of the debate around the world, is that these are the only tools in town for dealing with the fact that there are, in fact, evolutionary processes underway with huge tensions, huge interests at stake, but we're treating them as if they're purely scientific and just a matter of whether to go forward or not. So the pressure becomes unbearable. I don't want to bring anyone to tears by my <laughs> colourful <laughs> characterisation of the dilemmas here. So, even in a specific sense, even when we move attention in then, as I'm going to do now for the remainder of my talk, to the science of risk assessment, the, qu the answers one gets depend on the way one phrases a question. So, are we asking, for instance, as is often the case in differing ways in different contexts, is this safe? Is this safe enough? Is this tolerable? Or, as has happened on several advisory committees I've been a member of, is this at least no worse than the least safe existing thing that we can think about if we really rack our brains? <laughs> is that familiar? Because the answers depend very radically on the way the questions are asked. And let me illustrate very quickly some of the implications of this by referring rather rapidly to a field in which the canonical techniques of risk assessment, and I don't want to be, uh, it is unusual, and correct me if I'm wrong in this, that in the food safety area, risk assessment is undertaken in a comparative way, looking at the risks of a whole series of contending innovation pathways. Usually it's just, here's the dom incumbent pathway, is this acceptable or not, to some threshold. The way I'm arguing is it might be more reasonable to compare different options. So I'm gonna look at the energy sector, where I don't think it's uh, controversial to observe that it is in the energy sector that the techniques of probabilistic risk assessment are at their most mature and sophisticated for comparative purposes. So if I could make the point I'm about to make now in that sector, I believe it is even more true in other sectors such as transport and agriculture and food safety. And the point is simply this. A typical advisory committee or report will identify the risk of a particular option, a particular food technology might, might be the case by identifying a risk on some sort of numerical scale. And if a comparison takes place at all, it takes place like this, observing an increment and observing that actually one course of action might be better than another, aflatoxins compared to potential uh, releases from, uh, from uh, effects of GM, for instance. And so when one does, which is at itself quite rare, look systematically and in a balanced way across a variety of alternatives, one sees a picture like this, which engenders confidence that, yes, well, this is very complex, but look, we've got it pinned down. Here's the good ones on the left, the poor ones on the right. These are all real studies, by the way, for the energy sector. And we get a clear answer of which options look best. The trouble is, if one steps back and applies attention not just to a single study or a single committee finding, but to the peer-reviewed literature as a whole. And these are real studies with the number of studies in governmental studies, peer-reviewed studies on the right-hand axis, on the right-hand side of the chart. What one gets is distributions. I think people will be familiar with this because they don't appear, these types of charts don't appear in the reports themselves. They're meta-analyses. You don't actually get invited back to conferences so often when you show this picture. Fortunately, it's not food, so I might get invited back. But um, the point I'm making here, not only is there radical uncertainty. The scale, by the way, here is logarithmic, uh, so it's even more radical than first comes over. But the point is, using the sound scientific literature of risk assessment across the board in different fields, it is possible within the bounds of methodological rigor to justify, typically, any choice that one wishes. evidence base discussion is crucial, but it is extremely rare <laughs> that it actually determines a particular conclusion. Part of the evidence is the ambiguity and the uncertainty, and that unfortunately doesn't get attended to. 
And here's a whole host of framing assumptions of a kind any member of a scientific committee, of who, uh, which is much more experienced in the room than my own, will know very well. The kinds of ways in which this sort of framing comes out. How it can be in very subtle ways that an answer can take one form rather than another. So I want to uh, take this then as a segue into thinking about the nature of risk itself. Because it's not just a ground for throwing up our hands and saying, well, it's all, um, you know, here's some dirty washing going out, and now we're, we're actually humiliated by the apparent open-endedness of it all. Because there are actually some very practical implications. The first one is to take seriously, as precaution enjoins us to do, between risk and uncertainty in the first instance. Risk, going back to Frank Knight, the economist, 100 years ago, but actually goes further back than this to philosophers in many traditions around the world. Just observing there's a difference between where you do or do not have confidence in your knowledge. So a probability can, of course, be assigned anywhere by somebody so minded. But the question is, how much confidence can be invested in that probability? So recognizing an intractable state of uncertainty where we can't aggregate probabilities is a cru first crucial step. But that's not the whole problem. Because in the cr classical definition of risk assessment, of risk itself, there are two dimensions, the probabilities and the magnitudes, the severity of the effects. And with respect to that dimension, we also have a dilemma about how confident we might be in the knowledge about those magnitudes. So we might, for instance, have the kinds of disagreements or um, concerns that uh, Sheila Jasanov mentioned around what is the definition of benefit or of harm? To whom? How fair? What are the alternatives? How might we define different alternatives in such ways as to get rather different answers? Whose values and whose idea of the good society are being employed? These aren't external issues beyond risk assessment. They are absolutely intrinsic to it, embodied in the categories of harm and the categories of benefit to which probabilities are assigned. And then, of course, there's a conjunction of these dilemmas where we don't know what we don't know. BSE, endocrine-disrupting chemicals, stratospheric ozone depletion, some of the um, canonical examples of these dilemmas that we've faced as a society over the last few decades have been of this kind, where we were just plain surprised. It wasn't that, a, in retrospect, a, an unduly low number was put on a probability. We simply didn't anticipate the mechanisms themselves. So the reason for mentioning this is because, like the proverbial person with a hammer, we spend all our time up in the left-hand quadrant banging away at things as if they were risk. And that's not because anyone doesn't understand these issues, especially, as I mentioned, in the pub. It's because very powerful forces coerce attention up into that top left corner. Liability law, institutional remits, an agency that's charged to do risk assessment will have to do risk assessment uh, exclusively. Um, political cultures, indicators, insurance policies, stochastic models, aggregation procedures, these kinds of institutions, political patronage, especially the need of politicians and decision makers for justification. This is not a bad thing. A, a politician, one of the most powerful commodities that can be sought after in the political world is justification for your decision so that you can actually have some kind of momentum to actually implement it. Or, if it goes wrong, you've got someone to blame. Familiar? Now, these are real-world pressures that force attention in that top left box where justification is provided. But it doesn't mean that everyone should actually comply with that. It's not necessarily the interest of society at large for all the institutions involved to play that game. You don't have to disrespect politicians to think this is something that, especially in a democracy, might be challenged. So here are a few practical techniques that can be undertaken in order to open things up a little bit. Practical methods that, like Cinderella, don't de tend to get invited to the food safety appraisal party. Although on many occasions do, and by the way, a lot of these techniques I found out about through reading the literatures around food safety, which I'm sure many people in the room have been writing about, but don't tend to get talked about in the fashion I'm doing at the moment. So, we can move out of that top left box by taking seriously things that precaution talks about. The burden of evidence. Who has the onus of persuasion in different contexts? Uh, what kinds of decision heuristics are we applying? Are we looking for the best possible outcome under all circumstances or minimizing the least worst outcome? Uh, we can use interval analysis and sensitivity analysis systematically to explore the envelope of answers that a model will actually yield. 
Now, these are a bit nerve-wracking for a decision-maker who wishes to invoke the authority of a single number. But it's interesting how engineers, when they're characterizing the performance of a structure, are quite confident. Engineers are not lacking in confidence. And they'll use a sensitivity analysis to propagate through the tensile strengths or the thermal conductivity in various ways and end up with intervals. But in risk assessment, especially where economics is involved, it's very rare. Please correct me if I'm wrong in the, in the, in the uh, discussion section. And likewise, in addressing ambiguity, participatory measures, um, scenarios, backcasting, interactive models, so the models themselves are used, multi-criteria mapping, Q method, all sorts of measures are available to explore the ways in which the answer one gets from a risk assessment will vary depending on the way the question is framed, which is crucial in relation to those wider issues I mentioned. But the point here isn't that participation is romantically able to solve the problem, it's a participation can offer us ways to be more rigorous about the way the questions are posed, as well as being rigorous about the way the answers are derived. Where do the questions come from? It can help with. And down here, in the bottom left corner, uh, the uh, issue of citizen science was mentioned. Even though where we don't know where we do what we don't know, it sounds very philosophical. But actually, looking at diversity, flexibility, looking at options that if we commit to them, they're sometimes they're relatively easy to withdraw from, other times less so. If you, if you are thinking the risk assessment is sufficient, that doesn't really get paid attention to. But ability to commit or be flexible is a crucial issue in managing intractable uncertainty and ignorance. But civic research and monitoring, surveillance of various kinds, where you're not guided by an anticipation of a particular problem or the lack of that problem, you're actually monitoring in an open-ended way. And I think uh, my, my, part of my response to the question about citizen science is that can help uh, an awful lot in that kind of area. So ways of learning, ways of fostering adaptation are crucial, even in the face of ignorance. There are practical things we can do. So we move from a picture like the one in the top left to a, a, more, a greater degree of humility about what we can actually say about the kinds of conditions bearing on safe, food safety and illustrate the social choices that are faced and do so not just by showing uncertainties in the crude form, but by looking at a chart like this, which is a British a government advisory committee, the four, four real results from advisors who all came out with a consensus answer. They're all scientists, but they all disagreed radically about the relative merits and demerits and risks of a series of different food safety options. So unpick this, bring it out, and discuss it. Um, well, this uh, goes into a bit more detail, but I think I won't spend a lot of time on it. Um, it's simply showing that a group of individuals coming from government, from industry, from NGOs, but all of them are scientists of the kind that the British advisory system accepts onto a scientific advisory committee, um, will hold differences that are diametrically opposed. And it looks at the first sight that it is difficult to make sense. A body like the European Food Safety Agency might think, well, how helpful is this? Because it's not really clear what this message says. But actually, when a picture like this, a divergent picture like this, comes to common ground, you can be much more confident. So for instance, under this analysis, not just these four, but a whole series of these interviews with uh, a very large number of members of these committees, the study at the time concluded that actually no matter how you look at it, despite the disagreements, the government's favoured policy on GM of the time, the voluntary controls regime, everybody thought was the least best option for regulating GM. So where one sees the disagreements in an open way rather than rolling it together in a scientific consensus, one can actually find a cause for greater robustness on smaller and more precise issues. And one can also be much more rigorous and specific about conclusions like, for instance, well, in answering the question that the Commission has posed of our agency, we can say this, under conditions X, we would conclude A. <laughs> under conditions Y, we would conclude B. And the difference between X and Y is a political difference, which it is not really appropriate for a scientific body to uh, take responsibility for. So I come to the end of my talk by summarizing, going back to the beginning, how these practices can actually relate to the bigger picture, the rather daunting one I began with, with the cultural implications and the political economic implications around innovation. We have a system at the moment, and EFSA is embodied in this like few others, where we have powerful processes of lock-in, 
identifying particular technologies to the exclusion of others, which then the regulatory process is coerced into looking at with disproportionate attention, presuming certain benefits on a case-by-case -case basis, narrow remits, attention is aggregated together, uncertainties are neglected, and many perspectives are not uh, treated with the same balanced attention as others. When answers are given to political debates, they are closed down, simple prescriptive answers, this looks safe enough, that's that, which then has the effect of reinforcing lock-in. And what I'm saying is, without having to take the troubles of the world on their shoulders, scientific bodies can actually, at the same time, be more scientifically rigorous and actually help to foster more healthy and mature and robust wider debates by doing the following. Broadening out the issues that are taken into account, addressing other legitimate factors of the kind that have been mentioned in introducing my talk, a, a wider range of options, issues that are conventionally neglected, perspectives beyond the usual ones, uncertainties of the kind that might be treated as embarrassing because they can't really be aggregated. Uh, the precautionary principle helps a lot on broadening out in this way. And the European Environment Agency has done some great work identifying particular lessons in that respect. Broadening out what goes in as inputs to the regulatory appraisal. But also, the outputs can be opened up so that one actually does this plural and conditional advice that I've mentioned under which one doesn't pretend that all this aggregated complexity has only one answer, but one can see certain things just look like a plain bad idea, and there are conditional answers one can give that are much more explicitly tied to particular ways of phrasing the question. And in this way, I think we can help foster less of a lock-in process. It's not a pro-anti issue, it's about steering innovation in the most robust ways. It's a pro-innovation agenda, but it also has the effect of overcoming this apparent dichotomy that I began with, with precaution, between science on the one hand and participation and democracy on the other. Because in the end, science, ideally, and it aspires to this, rarely achieves it through peer review and communitarianism and accessibility and organized skepticism, is an embodiment of democracy in knowledge production. It is about the insight that knowledge is more robust when it is more democratic. And also, choices, innovation choices are more robust when the science is dealt with in more democratic ways and we have more of an innovation democracy than we do at the moment. Thanks very much. Uh, thank you, Professor Sterling. Um, fascinating. Uh, and you certainly took up the challenge to also present solutions and uh, I personally look forward to presenting some of your ideas uh, in various fora, and I look forward even more to the kind of reaction they might get. Uh, we have time for some questions. Um, I'm sure there must be, let's say, question marks out there on how this uh, approach would work in practice. So, uh, ladies and gentlemen, you have the opportunity now. Um, do I see any hands up? No, sorry. Yes, sorry. I see here on about four rows back. If we can get the mic to the gentleman, and if you could just tell us who you are, please, sir. Hello, Professor Yasar from Turkey. Uh, uh, Regarding your talk, uh, uh, I would like to ask a specific question. Uh, do you separately evaluate, uh, for instance, GMO applications in the United Kingdom apart from EFSA? And secondly, I am uh, also an uh, expert in uh, risk assessment uh, panel in Turkey, and we receive uh, uh, these days, uh, many uh, dossiers uh, from the uh, importers in Turkey, but uh, we don't really evaluate the dossiers it itself. We just evaluate the EFSA reports and some other reports available uh, at the globe. So in this uh, respect, uh, how we can be very democratic to evaluate, for, for instance, for the Turkish consumers or citizens, uh, the safety assessment of uh, 
these GMOs if we don't have access to the direct access to the uh, applicant's dossiers? Would you comment on this, please? Thank you. Well, it's a, a very challenging question, a very big question, and I wouldn't presume to be able to do it full justice, and I don't want to take up too much time, but thank you for asking. I think the part about the UK practice is probably much better addressed at uh, Sir Mark Walpert, who is chief scientist of the UK and will know more about the way Britain handles these issues than I do. So I, if, I, if you don't mind, I'll defer that. But the second part of your question about how to be democratic in a particular setting, I mean, there's no simple conclusion from my talk for that. One is simply not to, to be complicit as an agency or as an individual scientist in the story that the only real issue in the case you've mentioned on GM regulation that needs to be taken account of is safety. In fact, just like other areas of policy, there are political choices being made in the kinds of uh, seed production and agricultural strategies that are employed, and the choices between them are political in a much wider sense than safety alone. And it's all being forced into the safety box. Now, there's not, there's not much that an agency can do about that directly, except to acknowledge that it's the case and say, actually, it, this pro-innovation discourse is very misleading, and we're caught at the hard end. We're caught right between a rock and a hard place. It isn't actually about being pro-innovation. It's about steering alternative innovations, and perhaps the tension might be given to this, 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 or this alternative trajectory of innovation. That can be said by a body concerned with risk assessment, not in a normative way, but just in an analytical way, documenting how the issues are not as narrow as it is being asked to treat them as being, but it isn't competent to deal with the whole thing. And then the other part of my talk was to say, but there are techniques that can be used which avoid aggregation, and forgive me, I'm not so aware of the uh, situation you're mentioning with, uh, but in my experience, and people will correct me if I'm wrong, that aggregation is by far and away the tendency in these sorts of uh, situations, both judgmentally on committees and in terms of probabilistic reasoning, because of the pressure to justify. A decision maker wants a clear answer. So there are exceptions to this, but my, my suggestion is that that be uh, tested, and that instead of aggregating, that one uses methods such as the ones I mentioned to show how the answer depends on the question, even on safety. And that will help provoke and catalyze a more democratic discussion without the agency itself having to take on the burden of being entirely democratic itself. Uh, thank you, Professor Sterling. I think in the interest of good timekeeping and to give us an opportunity to have a good discussion at the closing session, we should break now for coffee. Um, I, sorry. Okay, sorry, I'm overruled by, <laughs> by the chair. Please, the gentleman at the back. Thanks very much. Just, I won't hold you up from coffee for too long. This is Cronin McNamara here from Creme Global. And that was a really interesting talk on the more nuanced approach to decision making rather than a yes or no, black or white, is it safe or unsafe? And in the context of innovation, um, what, what's your view on what role the marketplace plays in this process? in a view that the marketplace sort of represents democracy and what people want out there as well. So maybe you could comment on that, please. Thank you, yeah, it's a great question. And again, you know, um, I don't pretend any great authority on that particular issue, but I would say this, that the market is obviously really crucial. It is, it, to an extent, a way of recognizing this kind of complex latitude for choice I mentioned. But the market is very far from being democratic. It's not an uh, ideological point to observe that the market <laughs> contains interests of an enormously entrenched kind. So the decisions the market takes reflect the property rights and the endowments and the sunk investments in supply chains such as the ones that we've seen in uh, Sheila Jasanov's diagrams. So the choices taken by market depend on the sunk investments and the property rights and the levels of power in the market. So my point is, just as competition can be a healthy uh, aid to innovation in a market, so too, incumbent market players could do sometimes with a healthy bit of competition from political, of a political kind. So for instance, I regard the market being challenged on an issue like GM as very healthy because the market is steered in a particular direction. It's not necessarily somehow wrong, but it is being very powerfully steered to realize certain kinds of benefits for certain kinds of actors who are very powerful. They might be right, but that, we get better outcomes if that's challenged. 
So just as markets can foster competition, so a democratic political arena around the markets, recognizing the markets are constructed, can also help foster that same competition and in the same way give us more robust innovations. So I don't have a religious faith in the market. Markets are constructed and I think they have a role to play, but we have to look beyond them at the institutions that structure them. Okay, thank you. Um, we, let's resume at uh, 20 past four. Uh, the coffee is downstairs. My thanks to you all. Thanks also to the colleagues who are following this on the web and uh, look forward to the afternoon session.